You're listening to ConnectCast, brought to you by PrintPlace.com, helping churches connect with people and spread the word. My name is Malcolm Chackery, and today Richard Rising joins us. Um, Richard Rising is the founder and president of Artistry Labs. He is located in Dallas, Texas, and he has written the book called Church Marketing 101. It's a great read. I encourage everyone to get a copy if you're a church leader. So um, today we're going to go into detail more into church marketing. So Richard, if you could tell us a little bit about yourself and how you got started with church marketing. Yeah, certainly. Well, um, I had a life-changing experience with Christ when I was a teenager. And I kind of thought I was probably going to be called into the ministry some way, somehow. Uh, Didn't really know what that looked like. And uh, long story short, uh, I went to college found myself in a marketing class, kind of unexpected. I, I started out as an engineering major and uh, somehow found my way in a marketing class. My heart begins to beat out of my chest. I'm like, man, this is what I want to do with the rest of my life. I changed my major literally that week to marketing. And uh, here I was, very involved in my church on one hand, and then uh, I had the luxury of having to work full-time while I was going to college full-time. Uh, so climbing the corporate ladder in marketing over here and serving uh, God through, through my local church, uh, very active, very passionate about my faith. Uh, but these two worlds seemingly never even made it into the same sentence uh, until one time uh, after a number of years I was dating this uh, beautiful woman who's now my wife, Michelle, who she was also a marketing professional. So on dates, we would, we were marketing nerds. We'd drive around and say, what do you think about that billboard? You, do you think they hit their target audience? And do you think their font choice was correct? And uh, that's just, that's literally the way we were wired. Uh, but it wasn't until I went uh, on a mission trip to Mexico, I took some youth down there, and I really isolated myself to spend some time in prayer because I really sensed that my life was about to change. I just sensed that God was going to put something on my heart, and I kind of wanted to make way for that. I, I kind of remember thinking, I want to take hold of that for which he had taken hold of me. And so as a result, I uh, spent a number of hours in prayer, and after a number of hours in prayer, all of a sudden the two worlds collided, and I felt that God had really put in my heart that the body of Christ uh, promotes themselves like they're in the 1950s, uh, that in many ways they had lost their effectiveness at reaching the outside world, and that the marketing principles that I was utilizing on a daily basis weren't in contradiction with Scripture, but they're largely based on it, and uh, it called me to start up a firm that would change the way the body of Christ pursues the lost, not just in the U.S., but all over. And I was just blown away. Tear-stained pages of what I kind of sensed that was my purpose in life, uh, to leave corporate marketing and to serve the church, and that's kind of how it all started. I went back to tell uh, my uh, my girlfriend, uh, Michelle, at the time, again, now is my wife, um, and said, uh, let me tell you what God had put in my heart. And about uh, halfway into my story, she stopped me and said, let me tell you what God put in my heart while you were in Mexico. And literally we had coinciding vision for helping churches, and uh, it was extremely exciting time for us, other than the fact that uh, it was definitely not necessarily the time that you would ever use the word church and marketing in the same sentence. I mean, we're, we're talking about 96, 97, uh, and you just didn't use those words in the same sentence, church and marketing, for fear of being struck by lightning or something. Uh, so it was a number of years before we ever launched out, but uh, about 15 years ago, we uh, launched out, to basically left uh, a house and home to do all that we could to serve church and ministry, and it's been amazing, exciting, wild ride. It's been so much fun. That's a great testimony. Um, you know, could you tell us a little bit more about why you feel marketing is so important to churches? Sure. One of the biggest challenges that we dealt with when we started working with churches is is what their definition for marketing really was. They, they didn't know what marketing was. I'd say, yeah, we, we help churches with marketing, and they would say, oh, you do the door hangers. And we'd say, well, yeah, it's, it's a little bit, there's a little more to it than that. And um, I, I'll never forget, uh, we were doing a, actually a mailer for a client that, uh, that had, I think they had 300 people come to church for the first time as a result of the mailer. Uh, but then two months later, uh, they said, well, those people didn't stick, so the mailer didn't work. 
And uh, I remember thinking, ouch, wow, I think the mailer worked really well. Maybe there's something deeper here. And because my background's in marketing, and marketing really uh, is a much bigger umbrella than just a mailer and much bigger than your website, I would even go so far as to say this. Marketing is everything you do as a church that forms the perception of who you are in the world around you. Um, the definition that, that we believe that God's given us as it relates to marketing is pretty simple. It's that marketing is the management of perception. It's the management of perception. Now, it's not the manipulation of perception. It's not trying to convince someone you're something that you're not. It's managing perception. So that means if there are great things that are going on on the inside of your church and you're not letting the outside world know about those things, well, then you're not doing a very good job of managing perception. And at the end of the day, we all have the response, stewardship responsibility to communicate effectively to raise the name of Christ up in our communities. And ultimately, that's the goal of marketing. It's not to try and be slick and convince someone you're something that you're not. It's To be really honest, it's to tell your story well. And I think that's something that we can see throughout Scripture is, is, is the foundation uh, for reaching people for Christ is being able to tell our story well. Absolutely. And in your book, I had the opportunity to read uh, part of your book and, um, you know, and read through some of the chapters when I got your book. And really um, tell us about, you know, what churches should be marketing? Should, all, should every church be marketing? Well, the, I think we would probably say that Every church is marketing whether they realize it or not. So if, if you aren't cutting your grass, you're marketing. Uh, the name of your church, uh, the, uh, the, the, the way that you keep up your grounds, the way that your greeters greet, the way that your ushers ush, every single thing you do forms a perception of who you are and what you value and how prepared you are for the visitor that walks through the doors. And so I would challenge that every church is marketing whether they realize it or not, but some churches are just doing it really well, and some of it, some are just not paying any attention to it. And at the end of the day, I would challenge that it's, it is a responsibility that we have in stewardship to communicate effectively with the people that are interested and the people that walk through our doors. So in essence, I'd challenge every church is, is marketing, but doing it at an effective level is really what we're challenged to do. Absolutely. So, um, you know, you stated earlier that you started church marketing at a time when church marketing wasn't even in the church's vocabulary. Right. Um, tell us about how, where it's come, where it's been, and where you see it going. Certainly. Uh, at, at the very beginning, uh, I, I think people began to, uh, you, you know, they're isolated in do camps. You either uh, hated the word or or you you clung to it and you and you loved it um, and sometimes that that is inherently become the challenge sometimes those churches that use marketing the most maybe uh, at, had some challenges attached to them and therefore marketing in many ways got a bad name but at the end of the day um, what we've seen happen is, is that marketing in the church has become a lot more mainstream uh, we, we use a lot of different names for it now. We might call, we might utilize the word branding. We might utilize the word communications. But in essence, it is what the corporate world knows as marketing, and it's become a lot more mainstream. And as a res and, and and it's taken a lot of time to get there. But I think more and more churches realize that if the outside world doesn't get a fair impression of who we are, then they're not going to be. Then we're not going to be effective at reaching them. So it's become much more uh, common uh, to to think about to have people on either volunteer or paid staff to, whose responsibility is growth. Uh, you know, in the corporate world, about 10%. Kind of the rule of thumb in, in the corporate marketplace is that about 10% of one's budget would be spent on marketing. Uh, so when you think of these uh, big companies that you see advertising to you or, or even the small local companies, about 10% of the budget is spent on marketing. Well, it's because they have confidence in what they're selling. They believe that if they could get the word out, that people would respond to it positively. And I would just challenge to say that as in, in the church, we're still probably averaging about 2%. Uh, we don't spend uh, a lot on trying to get people to come in. And sometimes that's because we're not effectual at getting them to stay once we come. And in, you know, I, I'm going to challenge you, if you don't have that, that problem solved, 
uh, marketing isn't your biggest challenge. I've never seen someone walk inside of a church and say, man, I, I totally dislike this experience and I totally was confused by this church service, but their website was so cool, I have to go back. It just, <laughs> it just doesn't happen. Yeah. Um, but a lot of times people will overlook a website for a service that really knows how to resonate with people and connect Christ to right where they are. And so I, I would say one of the biggest challenges that we challenge churches with is that unless you've got uh, visitor retention at a, at a healthy level, which is going to probably be about 15% or higher of the visitors that come, then advertising is probably not your number one objective. As a matter of fact, we would say that most churches in the United States should not promote themselves. And people go, whoa, why would you say that? I say, you know what, if your current membership are not actively inviting people, there are reasons why. And if you do a mailer, you're just asking the outside world to come in and see why no one wants to invite anyone to your church. And they never come back and they tell all your friends not to check, all their friends not to check you out. That's not good marketing. Um, most churches in the U.S. have less than 10% visitor retention. And when you think about that, that means that if 100 people visited, less than 10 come back. Well, you know what? It was a big deal that those people woke up on that Sunday morning and came. It was a big deal. It was so hard for them. Uh, and we, it is our responsibility to be prepared for them, to make sure that we communicate effectively with them, that we create an experience that doesn't have any uh, caustic moments. Um, but when we present Christ, we present Christ knowing that there are people that maybe are unfamiliar with the gospel there that we have to reach as well as preach to the choir. And if we're able to do both of those effectively, we can create a church that's growing at multiple spiritual levels, not just the deeper going deep. So. In essence, uh, we say that most churches shouldn't promote themselves, but once you become healthy, once you begin increasing your ability to connect with people right where they live through your services, then that's something that's really worthy of promoting. And that's where it's, it take, it's worth the time and effort to get the word out uh, so that you can increase the growth and people can experience Christ in a healthy environment. Yeah, absolutely. You know, and I think that... Um we know that there are between 300 to 400,000 churches across the country. And, you know, that data is, you know, kind of vague because not all are report. Sure. But can you tell me wh what makes a church grow and what makes a church show little or no growth? Well, at, at, the, at the core, we kind of break it up into three segments. And I'll, I'll kind of draw this, let me see, draw this little funnel for you here. At the core portion of the funnel, we call it, what we like to define connectivity. And the, the, the next kind of segment that reaches out, we'd call brand. And the next segment would be promotion. The average church says, you know what, uh, we're not growing like we need to. We, need, we have a promotion problem. Um, but again, they typically are the average church that has less than 10% visitor retention. If I have, let's say I open up a pizza restaurant. And right across the street from me is an apartment complex that has a thousand people. And so I hang door hangers on everyone, get 50% off your pizza. Well, let's just say 500 of these thousand come over and eat pizza at my restaurant. But six months later, only 30 of them have ever come back. Okay. So I got them to come in, I got them to eat my pizza, but they didn't come back. Would you suggest that I have an advertising problem or maybe I have a pizza problem? I'd so probably some, say a pizza. <laughs> yeah, probably a pizza. So sometimes we have to be very objective, all right, and and look at ourselves from an outsider's perspective. You know what? Um, the Bible says in 1 Samuel 16, 7, that man looks on the outside and God looks on the heart. And as much as I'm grateful that God looks on my heart, where does man look? Man looks on the outside. So that means the people you're trying to reach, as much as you'd love them to come in your front doors and go, oh my goodness, this is the, I feel the presence of God. I will stay here for the rest of my life. I will back tithe for the months and years I wasn't here. It's not going to happen. They're going to come in and they're going to look on the outside and they're going to see how much you value them, how much you're interested in connecting their family with Christ. Um, they're, they're, gonna, they're, they're going to feel... Uh, the signals that you send. You know what? Uh, we send signals without ever realizing it. Sometimes uh, I, I remember 
we were wa wa working with the church, and they had, they had no signage. They had moved into a brand new building, and they but they had never taken the time or put budget into signage. Well, do you know what it means to a first-time guest to walk into a building that has no signage? Well, basically, without them, without the church realizing it, they basically were saying this church is for people that already know their way around. It's not for you, the outsider. You know, when what great signage helps people feel comfortable and at peace. Having people that are there effectively greeting and 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 providing a ministry service. That's that's paramount to walking into a restaurant. If you ever walked into a restaurant and you didn't have anyone at the at the uh, hostess stand, would you think that they were prepared for you? No. In the same way, we have got to do the things that we need to do to make sure that the people that come through our doors realize we're prepared for them. We've been thinking about them. We've been praying for them, and we're and that we've got a message prepared that's going to touch their heart and challenge them to take their next step with Christ. Then ultimately, that's ultimately uh, that's the challenge. That's all about connectivity. Connectivity deals with retention, and it deals with assimilation. Assimilation is just a fancy word for getting people to take steps. If you don't get people to take steps of spiritual growth, so for example, they make a, a, a commitment uh, to God. Maybe they make a commitment to be in a group. Maybe they volunteer. These are all examples. Maybe they 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 uh, just commit to coming on Sunday mornings. These are all examples of steps of growth. If we're not getting people to take those steps of growth effectively, and if we're not getting people to come back, aren't we have to we have to assess and, and deal with what are the real challenges that we have? And I'll tell you what, the website's great, but it's not going to solve that problem. If someone doesn't want to come back. A great website's not going to seal the deal, but a great website will improve the uh, the quantity of people that come in. And if you are doing a great job of reaching them, then it'll then it'll increase the number that stay, and that will create growth. So at the core of this, how does a church grow? Uh, is that we that that we're very effective at reaching the people that come through our door, and we take it with a high level of responsibility and stewardship. If if I if I'm stewarding my responsibility of, of visitors well, then I'll get more. Scripture says that he is faithful, and that which is least becomes ruler over more. If we steward those opportunities well, we'll get more, and at the and 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 ultimately we'll 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 pass the people test, right? That there, without realizing it, we we have a people test going on every Sunday morning. And if we pass the people test, then we'll increase our growth rates naturally. That's before one direct mail piece is ever sent out. Those are things you can do this week to be more effective at looking through at your church from an outsider's perspective and be thinking about how can we prepare for them more effectively and how can we reach them for the, with the gospel. Then we wrap brand around that. Once we get connectivity right, and, and it, then that means we've passed the people test. Then we write, create brand around that. Brand is basically design and a sense of self that we that we replicate in everything that we do. And you know what? If you've got connectivity, your likelihood of having great brand increases because you've proven you know you get people. If you don't get people and you try and look cool, and eh, you know what? People can smell right through that. So you want to have a brand that represents your ability to connect people well. And then lastly, then you want to be able to promote, which is inviting the outside world to come in and see and taste and see that God is good uh, and experience great things on the inside of your church. So why are some churches growing and others not? Uh, they're growing because they're winning at the basics, and that's connecting people with Christ. And if they're doing a good job of doing that, then, uh, then everything else is just uh, icing on the cake. But if you're not doing a good job of doing that, then you've got to you've got to start there to prepare yourself for growth. Yeah, absolutely. You know, I, I'm a big believer in small groups and connect groups. You know, um, I think those are very critical for a church. Uh, our pastor would say that um, you can't go into a church and connect with people if you're looking at the back of their heads. Hmm. You know, so yeah. I take. Um, you know, it's very really important. So. Um, in closing, you know, I, I want to let I want to let you know that you know I, I look forward to finishing your book and uh, reading it. I, I do believe from what I've read that there's a lot there's a lot of good stuff in this book, and 
if you're a church leader, you should you should read this book. I, I encourage you to. Uh, in closing, uh, I want to thank you, uh, Richard, for coming on today and uh, talking with us, and also give you the opportunity to share your Twitter, you know, your Facebook, whatever it is that you have, and tell Certainly. people where they can find you and how they can get the book. Certainly. Uh, if they would like to find out more, I think the book is a great way to do that. It's been endorsed by just about uh, every uh, every church uh, out there, especially uh, evangelical churches, churches that really have a heart to reach people, love the book, uh, so across multiple denominations. And it's Church Marketing 101. And you can get that on, at Amazon. You can also check it out on our website, which is also my website, and that's churchmarketing101.com. Uh, that'll take you to my website, Richard Rising, uh, my Twitter account at Richard Rising, last name is spelled R-E-I-S-I-N-G, Rising, and uh, love to connect with you. Anyone have any questions? The book's a great place to start, and as well, as a firm, we provide all kinds of services to help churches become more effective at artistrylabs.com. That's A-R-T-I-S-T-R-Y labs.com. Awesome. And uh, I'd like to encourage our uh, either viewers or listeners to follow us on our Twitter. Uh, it's at Print Place. Uh, also to follow our blog uh, at blog.printplace.com to learn more about printing, marketing, and, um, and graphic design as a whole. So uh, you've been listening to ConnectCast. Uh, we're here at printplace.com. We're connecting people and helping churches spread the word. Uh, My name is Malcolm Chakri, and I'll see you next time.